questions. Uh, today is a momentous mo uh, you know, uh, occasion for intent because we are hosting our first pitch competition. Um, so I would really like to thank uh, the, the participants, the judges, and the audience to be here to make this possible for us. Um, I'm going to keep this the overview for intent really short because we've already lost some really uh, precious time. So let me just quickly go over what we are about. Our purpose and mission is to basically, uh, intent is a Boston College graduate student organization providing mentorship, experiential learning, and collaborative resources to BC graduate entrepreneurs. Our mission is to develop, train, support, and inspire a community of entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial leaders grounded by Jesuit principles and dedicated to act ethically and altruistically in our world. Um, we have an entrepreneur journey, and our journey starts with basically what you are here for, a pitch competition, a pitch, not, not competition, but a pitch. Uh, every business idea has to be converted into a business plan so that it's perceived uh, in, in an appropriate manner uh, by stakeholders like venture capitalists and also influencers. Um, uh, in this, under intent, we basically have four di different programs, workshops, uh, apprenticeship program, incubator, and accelerator program that just started this year. Pitch competition is an extension of incubator program. Uh, there are participants that uh, in this uh, uh, pitch competition that are part of our incubator program. And there are also participants from different uh, schools like the law school, the school of public health uh, and the nursing school. So thank you all for making this intercollegiate, interdisciplinary uh, pitch competition possible. We have only been able to do this because of our student esteemed student leaders and our faculty uh, uh, advisors. Um, uh, we uh, these student leaders are you know only few that uh, uh, that have made this possible. We have sixteen uh, current student leaders uh, that are uh, involved in day to day operations for intent. And uh, today we have uh, over three uh, student leaders, uh, previous and current, uh, that are going to be a part of our uh, uh, pitch competition as judges. Uh, so I'm going to quickly let them introduce themselves. Uh, judges, please introduce yourself and also uh, talk a little bit about your um, affiliation with entrepreneurship to make this relevant for our participants. Hey, everyone. My name is Rajan Muswani. I'm an analyst at EduLab Capital Partners. So we're an early stage venture fund focused exclusively on the learning technology side. So. We like to think that if there's a learning component to a company, we're, we're interested. And, um, so we invest in seed in Series A, and, um, and that's that's pretty much been my my sole experience in entrepreneurship. Um, also a part-time MBA here at Boston College, and uh, really glad to be part of the Intent program. What would you like to go next? Um, I can go. You go ahead, Min. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Mint Khatanan. So um, I have been um, I have been an entrepreneur myself since 2016 after I graduated. So I founded a company, Rutes, is a um, off-bit lunch delivery company. So we are in the um, meal delivery company space. And in 2018, we get accept, get accepted to match challenge. Um, Boston cohort. So it's been a very great experience for me and the company and the employees. And yeah, so we grow the, um, our revenue go like almost 100% year over year, but we also face huge challenge during COVID. And I'm glad to be here to listen to all the business idea today. Cooper. Sure. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Cooper Stouch. I'm a JD MBA candidate here at BC. Um, I got my undergrad degree in entrepreneurship at George Washington University, where there I participated in a few pitch competitions. This is my first time sitting on the other end of them, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and do this. Um, yeah, so I'm, as a JD MBA candidate, I'm looking to fit myself into the entrepreneurship eco structure, uh, infrastructure until I can become an entrepreneur myself. Um, so working with uh, venture capital or uh, consulting with early stage growth companies, that's what I hope to do. Thank you, judges. 
Uh, before we dive into our uh, presentations, let me quickly uh, mention a couple of things. This event is recorded. Uh, uh, every presenter will get will have uh, five minutes to present. There is a hard stop at five minutes. I, if uh, you run over, I will uh, mute you, unfortunately. Um, they, unfortunately, because of the uh, time limitation, we don't have a Q&A session. So after the presentations, uh, judges will basically give you uh, uh, their comments. Each judge will get about one minute uh, to, to share their comments. And at the end of our event, we will uh, basically uh, uh, mention the winners. Uh, we'll have the first and the second winner uh, out of this event. And uh, we'll leave the room open uh, for anyone who wants to network, who wants to share experiences and have any follow-up question on any um, of the ideas presented. With that, let's start with our first presenter, Jordan Wilson. Jordan, would you, uh, are you able to uh, unmute yourself? I'm not on mute anymore. Okay, fantastic. Awesome, so good evening, everyone. My name is Jordan Wilson. I'm a young black voter and I'm the co-founder of Politicking. So four years ago, I had no idea how important of a journey my co-founder and I would embark on with Politicking. We founded Politicking out of a conversation in which we both lamented on the fact that as educated young women, even we didn't know everything necessary about candidates at the bottom of the ballot. Next slide, please. Since starting this venture, we've grown politicking into a political resource that's been recognized by the likes of CNN commentator Bakari Sellers. Next slide, please. Democratic Whip Dick Durbin and our very own President, Vice President Kamala Harris. Through our content creation and holding over 70 nationally streamed dialogues on issues such as the Georgia Senate runoffs and the Boston mayoral race, it's become increasingly evident that young voters of color are paying attention to politics. Can you turn the next slide? This enthusiasm has carried into 2021. With the persistence of racism, gun violence, and the coronavirus, there's a general lack of clarity about the future of democracy. With 2021 featuring high yield mayoral elections, voters need politicking to demystify the current political climate and provide constituents with information about electoral politics on a local, state, and a federal level. Next slide, please. Let's face it, casting a ballot in US elections requires thoughtful and informed participation. Next slide, please. Politicking is every American's easy to understand understand guide to voting and candidate accountability. Our users actually inform themselves ahead of election day by creating a virtual ballot and they stay up to date on progress that candidates are making. And they also stay vigilant of things which candidates are accomplishing through politicking's ballot guides. Next slide, please. Politicking does not impose traditional ideologies on our users. We all know that for modern voters, traditional ideologies can be a bit outdated. So we actually don't urge them to declare their own political ideologies. We actually don't impose their own, we don't impose political ideologies on them. Our community is made up of all gender, religious and ethnic identities from rural to urban areas all across the US. To date, over $10 billion has been spent on political advertising. And this is actually a prime market for our ad-based revenue model. This opens up opportunity for us to also reach folks through our revenue generating content, such as voter guides. Politicking will lead the way in doubling local, state, and national turnout rates. So much is at stake for us not to know who's getting the job done in politics today. Americans need politicking to boldly exercise our right to vote. As we celebrate opportunity and innovation today, it's actually important we remark that young voters of color are continuously growing electorate we've been critical to the development of a changing democratic landscape. This matters to politicking. And as we work to empower and ensure the rights of a young rising tide of young voters of color, we want to recognize the members and stakeholders in democracy and that it's important to use politicking as a tool against efforts to suppress our right to vote and put political capital into the hands of those who fought for it most. Thank you. Here's also a picture of our team, including myself and my co-founder uh, and two really key members to our board, including Jeff Johnson and Karen Freeman Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Judges, your uh, time to give Jordan some feedback. Rajan, would you like to start? Sure. 
first of all, thank you, Jordan. This was really great. Um, I think there's definitely a really big need in, in the market today about educating voters because there, there are a lot of people that only know things about two particular candidates, not, not really addressing anyone in between. Um, so whether that be from, you know, typical presidential elections, midterm elections, I think there's a real need for this. And I, I really haven't seen anything in the market that, that addresses how to, how to analyze political elections outside of the key, the, you know, the key news source out, the key news outlets. And, you know, obviously they have their own biases. So this is really great. Mint? Yeah. So, yeah, so I, um, yes. Yeah. So I, I really like this presentation. So um, one thing that I think it need to be addressed is um, the revenue model. I like that you put everything, I mean, very concise. And right now you have 10K user, that is great. And like for your apps for one, like 1 million, for this thing, I think it's good to, or investor to understand how you making the money and from the the active user how many how many of them like pay or maybe you make money from advertising or anything yeah so they want to understand how this going to to um to monetize cooper hi well i really like this presentation i really like the business idea itself um because, you know, I, as someone who's politically interested, you know, there is, you know, a lot of focus on these national elections, but it seems like this really kind of brings local politics to the forefront and allows people to get that kind of information. Uh, my only note uh, would be there are some real um, serious problems in the political news infrastructure right now. Uh, you know, trust in media is an at, at an absolute low. And, you know, there's a lot of data out there to support that. If you could flesh out the problem uh, to a greater degree in this pitch, I would really, you know, anchor the fact that this business is needed uh, and will likely support your contention that it's going to do great. So, but great job all around. Really liked it. Thank you so hey. much to the judges. Thank you. Our next presenter is Justin Zabora. Justin, are you here? I don't see Justin. I wonder if, um, I don't know, uh, we'll wait for him. He was when, here a second ago. Hmm. So we'll just uh, skip Justin for now. Uh, we'll get back to Justin after uh, we go through uh, maybe Edward's uh, presentation. Edward, are you here? I, I am here. Fantastic. Edward, uh, I will get your slides. Um, tell me when to stop. Is this it? No. That's it. All right. This awesome. is it. Okay, awesome. Take it give away. Me Just give me a second to start a timer on my end. Okay. I'm good to start. So you can go to the next slide. So my name is Ed Armstrong. I'm going to be talking to you about my startup, Tried It. And a little bit about myself, just to give you context on where I'm, where I'm coming from. Throughout my career, I've worked at numerous Fortune 500 companies such as Panera Bread and CVS Health. And in the roles that I've been in, I've always been ta tasked with a problem and had to find the solution. So at Panera Bread, it was helping them drive their beverage business by figuring out what products should they be rolling out, things like cold brew. And then at CVS Health, which I recently joined, it's how can they continue to power their business by finding new promotions to bring customers into the store. Next slide. So really my experience within retail at CVS Health is what brought me to found Tried It. And it really came from identifying a problem and finding a solution. In this, in this case, within retail, all retailers are, know that they're faced with this problem where they know that to be competitive with the Amazons, they really need to drastically change their business model. It's not enough just to, on the edges, optimize their business. They know that they need to be faster. They need to be easier to order from. They need to be convenient all around. They need to be more affordable. So why don't they change? Well, it's really not as easy as that. They're really stuck in a place where 
they both need to focus on what's generating the majority of the revenue, which is the traditional customers walking the door, while also focus on building their online business. So what's getting in the way besides that, really the model is set up to support the retail business. It's set up, the prices are set up to focus or to support a high, re, a high real estate cost. You can't have the right assortment because there may be certain vendor agreements. And then sort of, like I said, because they're focusing on their core business, they're really not devoting resources to focusing on this business. And really the overall hypothesis of, of Trident, which we're looking to solve is that brick and mortar retail really needs to transform in order to thrive long-term. Next slide. So what do, what, what do we do? So we really let brick and mortar focus on their core, what they're really good at, their bread and butter. So really the playbook of increasing how much customers are spending through their visits, customer retention. So really giving good customer service to get customers coming time and time again. So we'll, we'll let them do that. And really what's been long, too, long, too far long uh, deprioritized, which is the e-commerce business. That's really what we will help highlight and drive. So where, where does try to come, come into play? Simply put, we're a shared marketplace with uh, revenue sharing rights. So how this works is businesses of all sizes, small and large, can pool their resources and have a shared assortment. And it's a win for the customer and also for retail. For the customer, it allows an alternative that provides what customers want with long tail assortment. And then for small businesses, it provides revenue sharing rights where customers will be able, or small businesses will be able to get their fair share of e-commerce, where typically they're limited to transactions happening in the store, and now they can start tapping into digital transactions. Next slide. So how, how does this work? Just to talk through an example um, of a potential path to purchase. So let's say that a customer has a need or a want. They want to buy a bag of coffee. Well, first they decide what's important to them, what are the benefits they're looking for, and how should they buy it? So they may, they'll make a decision, should, and then they have to decide, should they buy it online or should they buy it in brick and mortar? And then they finish whatever they purchased and they have to decide again, what do they do? And each time this happens, there's an inflection point where brick and mortar loses out to the convenience of online. And that's really where Trident comes into play where each time that decision is made, now with Trident, if a customer buys it with Trident, if they buy it in brick and mortar, brick and mortar is benefiting. Next slide. So just quickly, it's a very attractive market. A lot have attempted to uh, mount an Amazon Challenger. Few have succeeded. With Trident, we'll be able to match the depth of the Amazon assortment, the price point that customers want. Next slide. So why invest? Simply put, um, it's really an investment in the lifeline in, in, in brick and mortar. And the investment will support an uh, MVP build out and initial vendor pilot. All right, that's it, thank you. Thank you, judges, your comments. I'll, I'll lead off this time. Uh, really, liked, really liked your business idea. Um, very interesting. Really seems like you, you, you led right off with your, your relevant expertise. So I definitely buy the fact that you have thought through this and this is gonna work and you have this great experience. Uh, my only note is in delivering your pitch, I might put somewhere in, in you know, an earlier section, a, a quick explainer of what tried it is. Uh, Cause you kind of went straight from who you are right into the problem. And it, it just felt like it took a while to get around to, to what Trident was, and I was waiting for that. So if you can move that up a little bit and just touch on that, I think it's a great presentation and a great business. Yeah, I, I think I agree oh, with that. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I agree with that. I think um, I think you did a really good job at addressing the pain points here and, and kind of what needs to change with 
with the brick and mortar industry. Um, and obviously really, really hard to unseat Amazon as, as pretty much the, the king of brick and mortar. And, you know, really liked your background. I think it's a very, you know, you know, very industry related and, and very, very helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, doing maybe less time on the pain points, uh, maybe like, you know, a couple sentences and then more towards the, the what the company is and how you're going to address that pain point going forward. Thank you. Maybe? Yes. Um, yeah. So my feedback is that the, um, I really like your background and your experience and this market is really growing. So um, the thing is that I, I feel that it's taken me a little bit hard to understand what it is, but I know that this is, I mean, that there is opportunity in this market. So maybe um, like, try to create a, I mean, make, make what you make it, um, it more easy to understand. I'm not sure if it's only for me, but I, I feel that it's just like present is in, make, make it more understand. I mean, easier to understand what this company is. Yeah. But everything else is, I, I, I feel that is excellent. Great. Thank you. All right, we have Justin back uh, with us. Uh, Justin, uh, I'm gonna uh, move back to your slides and uh, just let me know when to stop. Okay, great. Um, I am uh, ready whenever you are. You are. And I'll on. just say uh, next when it's the next slide. Sounds like a plan. Okay, great. So hi, my name is Justin Zamora. I'm a first year law student at Boston College. And uh, my product Zephyr is going to reimagine and reinvent the way that customers are going to shop for groceries. Next slide, please. So what is the problem? Well, to put it bluntly, the shopping experience kind of sucks. On average, customers spend about 45 minutes per shopping trip and they usually forget at least one item every time they go to the store. Next slide, please. Additionally, supermarkets are crowded. Uh, next slide. Lines are long. Next slide, please. And written grocery lists are so outdated. Next slide, please. So what's the problem? Well, basically supermarkets are stuck in the past and Zephyr is here to give them a much needed facelift. I've designed Zephyr with the busy mom in mind because statistically they do the most shopping for their household. Next slide, please. So what is the solution? Next slide. Well, by attaching a fully integrated custom tablet customers will be able to unlock a host of potential features such as GPS routing, dietary filters, and ideas that are gonna help inspire their next meal. Next slide. First off, through the use of optimized mapping the store, uh, through the store, customers will get in and out faster and this will lead to less in-store congestion and really an all around better shopping experience. Next slide. Justin, just to make sure that we are on the same slide, I think we are misaligned here. Oh, well, can we go, I'm sorry, can we go back? Is this the, are you able to see my screen? I couldn't, I was, I had uh, my blown up and I, I'm sorry, I, I thought we were on the same line. Let's, let's take it from um, GPS routing. Okay. Uh, I, I've now readjusted my screen so I can see yours. Okay. Okay, so um, actually, can we go back one more? I, I apologize. Okay, uh, so by attaching a fully integrated uh, custom tablet, customers will be able to unlock a host of potential features such as GPS routing, uh, dietary filters, and ideas that are gonna help inspire their next meal. Um, so the next slide is this, okay. Um, so first off, through the use of optimized mapping, uh, consumers will be able to get in and out faster, and this will lead to less in-store congestion. 
Um, next slide. Okay, so um, after that, the use of dietary filters will also allow for shoppers to narrow down their grocery items so that they can um, rest assured that the items that they are getting match their specific dietary restrictions. So of course you'll have uh, various things like uh, keto diets, paleo diets, vegan diets, and of course other examples might include things like um, halal foods, kosher foods, and lactose-free among many, many others. And again, these are all gonna narrow down the various items that uh, are in the grocery store to cater to the uh, individual customer's needs. Next slide. Um, and now third, for the busy mom who wants to bring home creative and new meals to the table each week, Zephyr has you covered. Simply swipe through the digital recipe book and pick a meal you like. Add all of those ingredients right to your digital shopping list and then you can seamlessly glide through the store. You'll even be able to email that recipe to yourself. Next slide. So now I'm sure you're wondering, how do we make money with this? Next slide. Well, in 2017, uh, Kroger's retail sales reached $105.1 billion uh, with 2,759 stores. Uh, the runner-up, Albertsons, generated uh, uh, some $57.4 billion, and that with 2,323 stores. So essentially partnering up with these companies, um, think of it like a sales force towards, uh, you know, tech companies or, or various other companies, uh, customer management relationships, um, but this time for the grocery industry. Um, and, and essentially, I'm just gonna go back one more, please. Um, basically by charging these uh, stores a licensing fee of about one to $10,000 a month, depending on, again, on, on square footage and industry, um, you'd be able to acquire uh, some funds that way. All right, next slide. Um, so the competitors are um, various uh, uh, Amazon Go and, and Caper.ai, which both offer a digital shopping experience. However, they're seeking to revolutionize through the use of uh, their own stores uh, rather than building on existing um, supermarkets, which there are plenty of. And, um, you know, there's no need to recreate the wheel when you can capitalize on what already exists. Some indirect competitors are Walmart and Target, um, and that's because they have grocery sales that uh, over uh, $288 billion, uh, and that's just due to the sheer volume of stores that exist within the United States. Um, so the next steps uh, would be, um, you know, designing this actual uh, modular unit that you'd be able to attach a tablet to a grocery store with. Again, we're not trying to push our um, own grocery carts on them. We're, we're really trying to work with the stores rather than revolutionize or, or again, recreate the wheel. Um, after that, it's about building an MVP and showing that it really works, performing small scale tests in smaller stores, um, building out additional features as necessary, depending on how the test runs go. And eventually, you know, hopefully uh, an acquisition from a larger retailer who's trying to compete with the Amazons of the world. And then those are my sources. Judges? I'll, uh, I'll take the lead here. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to see a, uh, a law student in this competition. Very happy you uh, decided to join. Um, a, a couple notes, a, a couple notes that I had. Um, my, my biggest one deals with the, the, the product and the revenue model where you're creating a product that's providing benefits to consumers, but you're selling this product to grocery stores. So the person using your product and the person paying for your product aren't the same person. So I would just like to see more in the presentation of why as a grocery store, this is going to benefit me and I'm gonna to wanna to buy this because it's gonna to lead to people shopping more or people buying new things with these new, you know, uh, the, the food ideas, you know, maybe it's, you know, getting people in and out faster is, you know, increasing, you know, velocity of payments. All those would be good things. I would just like to hear some, some more there. Um, and I think that would, that would tie together. Very neat idea though. Very neat. Uh, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, you know, unfortunately I didn't do a great job of exhibiting, um, you know, how the store benefits. Um, yeah, I was pretty customer focused, but the store does benefit because of the data that's acquired through these tablets, essentially by researching or, or rather gathering um, purchasing trends from the, the individuals, 
on the aggregate, that information is super valuable and they would be able to uh, re-divert their attention to the various products that are of the most sales. So that information is super valuable, customer loyalty. And this is why um, they have you scan your, your card, your, your loyalty card. That's really for information gathering purposes. It would be a similar feature offered in the, in the, um, with Zephyr. That's very neat. Um, I think definitely on your next run through of the uh, presentation, make sure you hit that point home because that's that's really interesting, actually. Thank you, Cooper. Yeah, I I totally agree um, with Cooper in that regard. This is a great product market fit. Um, however, I I think you might be limiting yourself a little bit on the addressable market. Um, I think I think kind of just saying that you're going to target busy moms, like I, I understand, but um, you know there are a lot of other demographics that would that would go for this product as well. Um, you know, especially like someone like myself, where you know I can walk into a grocery store and I don't always know where I'm going. So um, I think there's a lot of key demographics that would otherwise use this product as well. Um, otherwise, I really like the background research. Um, I think there's a clear product market fit. You addressed your exit strategy really well. And um, I think addressing the pain points from the beginning and then kind of going into what your solution is, is was really great. Awesome. Thank you, Rajan. Mint? Yes. So I, I really like everything in this presentation. And I mean, everything is very easy to understand. The revenue model is very clear and the opportunity is that there is an opportunity in this market. The only things that I question is about the, um, because the product is very technology driven. So how many people in your team that going to help you execute this? I think that is, that is the only question that I, I have and it will be good to mention that because um, the person who ex executed is going to be important, an important factor as well. Thank you, Mint. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll keep uh, our judge, uh, you know, past uh, inter presentations to uh, judges' comments only uh, because we have about uh, five more presentations to go through. So with that, we'll go to the, our next presenter, uh, Alexis Free. Uh, she is a part of our incubator program. It will be interesting to see how she has been able to integrate all the resources that we have provided her. Obviously, her uh, hard work being the most important part of it. So I'm going to get to her slides right now. Okay, Alexis, you're on. Thanks for the introduction, Vishal. So just a little bit more about myself. I'm a current student in- Vishal, I think you have the wrong slides up. Oh wait, nope, never mind. sorry. No, just... no this is the right one. <laughs> I totally apologize, my bad, I saw you. <laughs> you're good. No worries. Yeah, so for a little bit more information about myself, I'm a part of the MSA community and was part of the incubator and apprenticeship programs in Intent. So. I wanted to start this presentation off with a very simple question that I want you guys to think about. Who do you trust with your finances? Your friends? Your family? Uh, would you mind going back, please? Thank you. The, t the accountant you've been going to for years? All perfectly valid answers. But what if I were to tell you that you may not be getting all of the refund or tax breaks you're qualified for? The IRS estimates that over half the tax returns filed by paid preparers do not give clients all deductions and credits that they are qualified for. In addition, databases designed to match tax filers with tax preparers are unreliable and don't focus on what clients need from an accountant, nor do they list the licenses and qualifications that reliable tax preparers should have. Larger websites that host reviews of local tax accountants have information that is so out of date and completely irrelevant to the current tax code as of the 2017 changes that it's just essentially useless. You also have larger companies claiming that they'll be able to file your taxes for free, but then you have that one tiny extra form on your return that makes you spend an extra $100 because the company said that that's not for free. Wouldn't the process be significantly easier and less stressful if all the information you needed and all the fees that you knew you were going to pay were laid out right in front of you? Uh, would you mind going to the next slide? Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, next one. Thank you. This is where Finance Matter comes in. We are dedicated to ensuring that our clients have their needs met with no gimmicks and false advertising. We focus on the ease of use and transparency between tax repair requirements and client needs. The professionals we work with are all accredited to FASB and CPA boards with up-to-date reviews and information. And we ensure that everything is up-to-date, 
So you can be rest assured that you are indeed receiving what you want it, what you want with this with this preparer. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. To elaborate further on our business model, let's take a look at the tax industry as a whole. Tax preparers earn a lot of money. The expected net worth of the industry in 2021 is roughly 10.9 billion US dollars. Over half of all returns prepared are denoted as standard, which essentially means they're a little more complicated than a standard W-2 only return. And since they're more complicated, they require more money. As you can see between in the major players, while local preparers are the slight majority, you have bigger companies with large lobbying power like H&R Block and Intuit who have a lot of power in the government that local tax preparers don't have. But local tax preparers don't hide pricing unlike larger companies. If you look up any articles about Intuit or TurboTax, you can see a lot of headlines about people getting unexpected charges or unnecessary fees that they were not told they would be paying in the first place to file. Compared to larger sites such as Angie's List and Thumbtack, our services provide, aim to provide the best experience for the client by linking them to a tax preparer directly. Other sites such as Google Maps may provide some office locations in your local area, but if a new business isn't in the search algorithm yet, you might miss them entirely. We aim to combat this sort of disinformation by frequently updating our website profiles, including information on language and tax preparer specialty to ensure that ta information taxpayers may find helpful is not lost in translation and can properly be used. Our services also aim to have the taxpayers receive face-to-face -face services faster so that any questions they have might be answered, rather than being forced to prepare their re own return through an algorithm that may miss essential information a taxpayer could use because of complicated jargon. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Our revenue model is primarily based on advertisement revenue. We believe that integrity is key to our services and that there is no need for money to be paid upfront by taxpayers since they have to pay the preparers a large sum at the end. We aspire to have a freemium membership model as well as for preparers, as well for preparers who want to have more presence on our website. With any additional funding, we aim to expand our operations and improve our advertisement functionality with any future investments. For final remarks, I wanted to ask you guys to reflect back on that question that I asked at the beginning. Who do you trust with your finances? If you suddenly had a change of heart, do you know how you would go about finding a new preparer? Do you happen to know of any certified preparers or would you need the assistance to find a new one? Thank you. Thank you, Alexis. Um, judges? Wow. Uh a really strong pitch, I thought. Um, really well put together. It seemed like you really know your stuff. Um, loved all the data you were bringing there. Um, I think uh, my only note, if I, if I have one, um, I think you can be creative with the revenue model. Um, and considering the fact that you are essentially a customer acquisition tool for these local tax preparers, um, some revenue stream coming through them wouldn't be uh, something bad to consider. Uh, just to supplement ad-based revenue. Um, but other than that, I thought it was a really strong pitch. Thank you. I uh, really liked the presentation. Um, I, thought, I thought it was very clear and concise. Um, one comment is if you, can, if you can write down the addressable market, I think that would tell a, a bigger picture to, to potential investors. Um, Personally, I like to see what the addressable market would be, um, just to see what exactly who exactly you're selling into. Um, and then, with that being said, are you you need to clear it up about who you're selling into? So, whether that be you know selling directly to um, accountants to clients, um, and really kind of make that clear. And if it's a two sided marketplace, then then definitely definitely address that as well. But otherwise, I really enjoyed the. the what, what you're trying to accomplish. And I think there's a really big product market fit here. Thank you. Yep, so I, I literally let, this really read myself to your product. So if I would, I, I would be your customer. So um, all the pitch is great. And yeah, so I don't have any any comment on this, but because um, other judges already mentioned, but I really like this business idea. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Uh, our next presenter is supposed to be Bridget, but I don't see her here. 
Uh, so while I figure out what's going on, maybe she's unable to join. We'll go to our next presenter, Henry. Henry, are you here? Yes, I am. Hello. Fantastic. Uh, and this is you, right? Yeah, that's me. Fantastic. Please go ahead. It's all you. Thank you. Um, as Vishal said, my name is Henry Cabot. Um, I'm a 1L in uh, BC Law School, and I'm here to represent LaPel on behalf of my team. Have you ever been in a pinch and needed a tailor, but have no idea where to begin to look for one? Or perhaps you have a suit or jacket that doesn't quite fit the way it used to? Why go buy a new one when you can just have it re-altered? But how does one go about this? We believe that Lapel can offer the solution. Lapel will make connecting tailors to customers a seamless experience. We are three entrepreneurs with over 35 years of retail experience between us. We know where the tailoring business has been and we're ready to lead it into the future. If you could go to the next slide, please. Tailoring is essential to the men's and women's wear businesses. However, due to a lack of infrastructure, a prevalent language barrier, and the fact that tailoring tends to be largely word of mouth, it can be difficult for tailors and clients to find each other. How can we connect these two parties? If you can go on to the next slide, thank you. Lapel can help connect the disparate tailors to the people who are looking for their services. Lapel intends to screen, list, and ultimately market tailors to the public. The goal is to have a directory of local tailors with the services that they offer. This can help clients find quick, reliable turnaround for emergency services or build a more substantial relationship. By handling the marketing of tailoring and consolidating all aspects into an easy to use framework, Lapel can help overcome much of the language barrier as well as the problems that arise as a result of the word of mouth business. Closest approximation to our service might be something like an Angie's List, a Craigslist, or a TaskRabbit, but because these are all such overly broad forums, there is currently no quick, easy to use service on the market that can provide what we can provide. If you can go to the next slide. Lapel has multiple avenues for monetization. First by commission from services, and then as we grow by the subscriptions of tailors. As part of this, we intend to offer membership tiers. Featured tailors will have access to exclusive services such as marketing, professional photography, bio writing, and others. We also intend to offer corporate discounts and packages for companies that require their employees be well-dressed. Further, the potential for data capture would allow multiple ventures to be started in the fashion field. Tailoring is a mid-sized market. Tailors are scattered across the country, concentrated typically around the big cities. Today, there are approximately 60,000 tailors in the US. Clothing alterations are approximately a $2 billion industry per year. The need for tailoring is expected to grow at a continuing rate of 5% per year. And this increase is coupled with a decrease in capable service providers. We can go on to the next slide. If given your support, Lapel hopes to develop a website and app once we have the infrastructure, we'll be able to begin personally vetting tailors and putting them in. After this, we'll be able to market our product to clients. Lapel's business model is transitional and we would be able to pivot both into the realms of other specialty fashion, such as leatherworking, cobbling, handbag repair, and many more. Further, client data capture would allow us to look toward other fashion business models. Thank you. Mint, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, one thing that I would like to, um, to know is about the competitor in this market. So if you can like um, present the competitor, that would be great. So um, for me as someone that might don't be understand this market that much, so I would like to understand more in terms of like how many competition in in this business? Yeah. Um, I can tell you that there's nothing that currently exists. Uh, there was a company that provided this service, um, but uh, they seem to have uh, cashed out early. They sold the data and they stopped providing the service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you can like. Uh, I mean, men provide that. 
Yeah. Um, what one note I had, um, and just just a thought. I so I'm I'm not a person that uses a, a tailor. I, I just I guess get clothes off off the rack. Um, I would like because tailoring to me um, seems more at least on the individual level like somewhat of a niche uh, business. I would like just to hear more in your pitch about um, who uses tailoring services because you had some interesting points in there about you know working with with companies as well and i just uh i would just like to hear a little bit more it when you when you pitch about like fleshing out that like there's a bunch of people out there who who need tailors and and can't find them i just felt like there was a a, a little more work needed to be done there to verify that this customer segment existed and that this problem was real and felt Yeah, I, I I enjoyed the the presentation. I, I think there is a, a you know it's a very interesting product. Um, you know, I, I for one always can use a tailor and and you know figure out where where one can be and, and what those hours would look like. Um, I think I think doing a little bit of analysis on your competitive landscape would be great. Because I, I for one, want to know how you would be different from, from per se, Google Maps. Um, and, you know, have a slide that's based on, that, that basically talks about your business model. Because um, I want to know who you're selling into. I want to know, you know, where, where your revenue is going to be driven from. Um, other than that, I, th I think you did a good job at addressing uh, what the potential market would be and, um, and, and overall pretty well. Thank you, judges. Our next presenter is Tommy. So, hey, um, Tommy Katuki, uh, presenting on a rechargeable battery and distribution system. Next slide. So I'm a first year MBA student, um, having come from a variety of startups and government type roles. Um, and I was kind of inspired by this idea that someone mentioned that they didn't want to buy an electric car because of, it was distance limited. You have to keep charging it eventually. You can't go long distances if you want to make it, if you have an emergency meeting and you're in Boston, you need to get to Washington, D.C. Um, you have to stop in New York. Um, next slide. So the problem is kind of twofold. Uh, there, are two, there are two current ways to charge your electric vehicle. The first is using something that everyone's familiar with, Tesla-like uh, charging station. You go there uh, um, either at your, have it at your house or at a, like a parking lot or a supermarket, and you can use a normal one, or you can pay to have it supercharged, uh, which still increases the time that it would take to charge from eight hours to maybe half an hour, but it still takes much longer than traditional gasoline. The other alternative is a complete battery, uh, battery replacement system, which is being seen in NEO and uh, some companies that haven't worked out in the past, which they actually swap your entire base battery in the bottom of your car in about five minutes. Um, but these are incredibly complex or proprietary and they don't usually work out. Um, next slide, please. So my solution is that it, to add an additional battery pack to the back of the car. By using a replaceable and rechargeable battery through a distribution vent like system, like a vending, vending machine type system that you can find at car dealerships, gas stations, and uh, various places throughout America and the world that still serve, that can either be traditional gasoline places still or supermarkets, uh, it will allow cars to get additional electricity to both charge their car while it's driving um, and to add an, an additional charge to, to make sure that if they have an important meeting or uh, an incredibly long trip that they can't stop for to give them the power to continue. Um, so I'm going to be using, the, currently the current battery setup is lithium, lithium ion, um, which is being used in major car batteries. And through a transformation, lithium air is actually with, uh, is viewed as energy density as gasoline. And by using that, um, we're basically going, you'll be able to lower the actual weight of the battery to something that's easily carryable. And that from going from, a machine, you can just bring it to your car and plug it, swap it out. So the, the model is essentially that you, you'll, if you, you know, you need, feel like you need extra electricity, you're going to go to a gas station, 
you're going to go to the back of your car, you're going to pull out um, kind of like a brick or a cylindrical type object. You're going to walk into the gas station, uh, swap your membership card or just type in a number, uh, pull out a new one, plug in, an old, pull, plug in your old one and go out to your car and drive away. It's that simple. Next slide, please. So the market dynamics of this are, is that we're basically going to be sliding into the current electric vehicle um, system that with the transformation of electric vehicles, a lot of companies are saying that they want to go partially or full electric vehicle in the near future. And following that, you're most likely going to see government regulations that are going to force vehicles to adopt systems like this. So I want to work within that uh, market and kind of prioritize both technological innovation and the foreseeable future of companies wanting to work for and have something that makes people buy batteries net, buy their electric cars now to drive innovation and drive my, um, my, my business. The, the ways I see it at the, way, the business model I see um, transforming in a way that either forms as a membership type system that you yourself purchase or is acquired through your car company um, and they'll pay kind of an up membership or upkeep charge that allows you to go either in a regional area or an entire national area, which either could be on small vehicles or transformed into trucks, which need much faster and specific uh, trans transformation when they go across either America or Europe or other places in the world. Um, to my knowledge, there is no known competitors like this. The only company I could find was GoGo Row in Taiwan, which dealt with one uh, kilowatt hour uh, scooters, and one kilowatt hour only provides you about three miles of driving. So we're aiming to go even higher than that. Next slide, please. Uh, my final message is that um, using your investment or your advice, I'm going to drive and create a actual prototype lithium air battery on a distribution system. Currently, I'm going through a lot of thesis and dissertation literature on material sciences and other stuff to find a good model that is, um, can actually be transformed into more of a commercialized entity. There have been prototypes that have successfully been modeled um, but I want to bring that into more of a commercial world and outside of the lab. Thank you, Tommy. Imagine, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tom. This is, uh, this is really interesting. And I, I think there's, you know, as the world grows into the electric car market, I think your, your market will continue to increase and increase. But if you can, and, and on that point, if you can talk a little bit more about what the electric car market looks like today, and what it would look like, say, five years from now, I think that would be really interesting because obviously that's going to change, you know, X amount, you know, just given the technology that's that's going to come out, especially from, from the Tesla front and all of its competitors. Um, and then talk about a little bit more how you're going to develop the product going forward. But otherwise, it's a really cool concept and, you know, definitely jump on the opportunity if there's if there's no competitors in the at the moment yeah wow a, a really neat business idea i mean very very creative very interesting um it's a big bite out of that technological apple though you know it's a um this is going to be a business that is the execution is going to be the most uh, critical and potentially difficult part because you've got a lot of highly technical things. You've got a space where you're probably already getting large investment from, from people like Elon Musk and others looking into sort of this kind of technology. So when trying to sell um, judges or investors on, on your ability to carry this through, um, some more information about um, you know, how, how you're going to win that race to, to get the lightweight, replaceable, rechargeable, universal car battery. Because um, it's, really, it's a really neat business idea. And if it, you know, if that came to fruition, I mean, that'd be a, a huge market cap. But um, just closing that plausibility gap uh, is, is something you're going to want to focus on in, in your pitches going forward. So for my for my feedback is that the um the market is very interesting. the The only question that I really want to know is that like um if you can 
um, present the um, the cost of goods to produce this and how the margin will be because if you mention that like um, there might be no I mean where when it builds company doing this maybe just only one or something so um yeah so I think it's good to know that like how expensive to 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 create this battery and how is the margin will be and will you manufacture in I mean any other country and what is the cost to to um to to this to be, I, I mean to 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 ship it to the US and all that. I think the um the cost of good is very interesting part as well to present for this concept. I mean this product. Thank you, Min. Now we are left with two more presenters. Uh, we have kept these two presenters at the end because uh, these presenters are actually not with us. They had a class conflict. One actually has um, uh, an exam at the moment. So I'm going to present, I'm going to run their, they basically recorded their five minute pitch and send it to us. We're going to run them and we, we are going to pretend as if they're here uh, and run it as if uh, they are you know, a part of the normal uh, um, uh, pitch competition. We did this to make sure that uh, nothing prevents people from uh, competing and, and, and participating in this event. So with that, let me um, run uh, uh, the five minute pitch from Bridget um, uh, Sakoski. She is our uh, uh, intent uh, uh, incubator program participant from the School of Nursing. So here is her video. Are you guys able to see uh, this video? Hi, I'm Bridget Sikowski and I will be pitching for Sunshine, Sunshine Workplace Consultant. In a country that is living through a moment of collective trauma, we need to support those who care for us. More than half of adults have experienced a severe stressor in their lifetime, which has led to 5.7% of, of all adults developing PTSD during her lifetime. In this current COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC has found that anxiety has tripled and depression has quadrupled since 2019 among sampled adults. Boston University has further supported the impact of this moment by finding that this is similar to the post 9-11 moment or the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. As a Social work professional who worked in the human rights field and subsequently now in clinical social work. I have seen the impact on myself, my colleagues, and our partners over the last seven years as burnout, vicarious trauma, and workplace trauma has had their impact. I want to build and sustain a workplace for myself and for others that allows employees to do the best work that they can and to, in a safe, and healthy environment. Through a consulting business that has standardized training, evaluations, and long-term engagements, we hope to create workplaces that are trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive. The problem based on the statistics is pretty clear. Leadership of caring professionals, whether it's hospitals, nonprofits, or schools, need to have increased knowledge and access to resources to be able to adequately respond to the needs of their staff. This is a new emerging area as we have pivoted from a self-care individualized response to a more community-based collective response to widespread trauma. Ultimately, this is going to increase productivity, reduce staff who are leaving the profession. It has been found through various resources and research studies that for every $1 spent on mental health, there is a $4 return to the economy, which helps to counter the 17 to $44 billion lost each year to depression. There is a lot at stake in ignoring this issue and ignoring the way that trauma is showing up in the workplace. So the solution is to provide a comprehensive approach to building knowledge and trauma-informed practice throughout all levels of caring organizations. 
this is going to include evaluations, trainings, and ongoing coaching on the implementation of trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive practice. At, through the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the increased discussion on the racial violence and trauma being experienced in the U.S., workplaces are feeling the impact and currently searching for solutions to address these issues head on. In this new emerging space, there's an opportunity to use my ability and skills as a both nonprofit professional as well as a social worker to bring trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive practices to these workplaces. The caring professions are constitute a multi-billion dollar industry with expected growth around 5% annually, particularly growth centered around the healthcare part of this industry. This is a service profession. Staff productivity and efficiency are the backbone of this industry. It is run on human capital. So to support these businesses, support these nonprofits and organizations, we need to support staff. Staff have consistently reported prior to the pandemic and even more so currently that they are overworked, under-supported, and grappling with vicarious trauma from their work. As a result, we need to bring social work, neuroscience, and nonprofit practice together to find a solution. Sunshine Workplace Consultants is the solution. And through an investment, we can begin to prepare and launch our standardized offering increase our marketing awareness of product need focused on the immense need in this moment for trauma-sensitive supports and making that very clear to organizations that this ultimately saves them money. This will then reduce trauma in the caring professions and bring care to those who care for us. All right, that was Bridget. Now we have um, a pitch from Alexandra is Piliakos, and uh, I'm going to get her video here. Just give me one second. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Alexandra Piliakos, and I am the founder, director, and your host of the Business Sustainability. Before we dive in, I want to take a look at this case. The sustainability of data analytics featuring the back door, the business case for online education, sports marketing, and the Super Bowl. And of course- Michelle, could you raise the volume slightly if possible? Sure. My computer is lagging a little bit as well. So apologize for uh, that. Might take a second to do this. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Alexandra Spiliakos, and I am the founder, director, and your host of the Business Caselet. Before we dive in, I wanna take a look at this first slide. The sustainability of chewing gum. Data analytics featuring The Bachelor. The business case for online education. Sports marketing and the Super Bowl. And of course, retail brand collaborations. What do all of these topics have in common? They all focus on one piece of business management strategy, as well as uh, something that might be seen as hip or current in today's news. That's what we do at the Business Case Lib. We try and make business learning experiential and of course, fun. So what is the Business Case Lib? The Business Case Lib, modeled after the MBA case method, is a YouTube video series designed to help viewers learn about business through real time and accessible examples. For those of us who are not fully in the weeds with the business case method, the case method is designed around mimicking an experiential learning scenario and is centered around a memorable story to drive stronger takeaways. Research has shown that, that students have stronger takeaways when they have a story to anchor those learnings around. So that's really what we try to do at the business case lit. Just to provide a little background on my founder's journey um, with the business case lit, the business caselet was inspired by the realization that there's a major shortage of MBA style or case method learning materials available online. For this reason, the business caselet episodes provide five to 10 minute videos 
or little deep dives, as I like to call them, into companies, industries, or products. And they're all anchored around a story or a scenario for maximum retention. During my two years that I spent at HBS Online, writing online courses and contributing to the online business blog, I found a true passion for creating these types of learning scenarios, as well as for immersing myself in them as somebody who's interested in becoming an MBA. And I wanted to you know, pay it forward and create a resource for students like me that might not be able to take uh, or commit to a full course, but still are interested in that business caselet learning style. Since December, 2020, when I first launched the business caselet, I've launched 13 videos that have in total garnered over a hundred watch hours, um, which I think for a startup channel is um, a pretty good track record so far. So I feel like we have some momentum going forward. Our topics at the business caselet include strategy, marketing and branding, disruptive technology, sustainability, and so much more. And we feature businesses that are relevant to viewers' day-to-day -day journeys as buyers, consumers, or observers. Our target audience is primarily viewers who have an interest in business management and can be imagined to be pre, post, or during MBA stage of life. In terms of next steps, um, I believe that there are both short-term and long-term goals that I can see the business case like going. Uh, for the short-term goals, I would love to focus on marketing and engagement as well as content management. On the marketing and engagement side, I would love to maintain the uh, website, which is thebusinesscaselet.com, make that sort of a true north for all, all materials concerning the business caselet. Um, I also think it would be very beneficial to cross market on social media and Instagram or Facebook um, and to be featured on secondary blogs with similar target audiences to increase uh, the top of mind recognition for the business caselet. In terms of content management, um, I've already begun to develop an editorial calendar, but really making that, again, a true north um, would make sure that the content um, is at a steady stream. Secondarily, I would love to develop learning tracks such as um, marketing video series or a media management series and to build out content writing teams to take ownership of those tracks to, again, ensure uh, a steady stream of content. In the long term, I would love to focus on scale. Uh, first, I would love to streamline co the contribution to feature additional MBA students, as I believe it's, it's a truly, um, truly great and tangible way to demonstrate MBA learnings to potential employers. So I feel there's a mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial experience there. And of course, I would love to consider additional possibilities um, for products or communities that can be created in extension of the business caselet. I really have great hopes for the business caselet. I think it can drive true impact. And I'm so excited to potentially partner with one of you investors. Um, and I appreciate you listening to my pitch. Thanks so much. All right, that was Alexandra. Now, um, we're gonna give uh, the judges a few minutes to work on their scores and figure out who our winners are. Um, we'll give them about five more minutes. Uh, most of the scoring has already been done, I, uh, as I see. Uh, in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about your experience. Several of you are not from the business school. Uh, by the way, judges, while we speak, you're more than welcome to uh, go on our shared um, Excel sheet and uh, let us know whenever you are done with your scoring. Um, Michelle, is it possible if you could put us maybe in a breakout room also so we could discuss amongst ourselves? Sure. Um, Ed, is that possible? I don't believe so. Not with the webinar. Okay. Um, in, in it's the, not, uh, not necessary. Yeah. No worries. Cooper, I, I would suggest if you are able to uh, basically uh, have a Google Meet session separately amongst uh, you all, maybe that will help. Okay, maybe, maybe not right for the time. So no worries, I'll just update the sheet. Okay, okay. Let us know uh, whenever you guys are done with the uh, scorecards, okay? Thank you. Uh, with that, presenters, uh, let's talk a little bit about your journey. Several of you are not from business school. And this is probably one of the first times you have presented. Uh, we would like to know what was your experience like? What, was, what were some of the you know, common hurdles that you have encountered? And how did you uh, 
uh, you know, what was your experience like basically uh, getting over them? So whoever wants to talk, uh, please go ahead. Love to hear. Yeah, I'll start. Um, one, I'm from the law school, actually. I know that I've got another colleague from the law school, but I'm representing as a 2L. And in terms of barriers to overcome, there are some obvious ones, obviously. Um, but particularly in, with politics, I think there's always this assumption that the only way you can make an impact is through campaigning. And I think that's furthest from the truth. Um, I don't think that, you know, the importance of political data is emphasized enough and then variant ways to create data. And so um, that was really, you know, in addition to my story with starting politicking with my co-founder to inform ourselves also an equal aim. We understood that um, data is very much lucrative, as mentioned during the pitch, uh, that wasn't broken down as much, but is a large part of our revenue model and is, of course, um, I think something that's going to shape the changing political landscape. Um, and also to my point of, or to the question of overcoming barriers, that's another thing. There's not enough data on uh, voters of color and particularly younger black voters. And so to that issue, politicking will really crush, you know, just the gap uh, that is, exists among data and voters of color. Thank you, Jordan, for sharing that. Anyone else would like to discuss or share their experience? Um, I'd like to uh, just top in here real quick. Um, I did enjoy the experience. I appreciate you all hosting. Uh, I've done pitch competitions in the past in terms of barriers for entry that were unique to this pitch competition. Um, certainly the technological aspect was difficult to accommodate uh, to some degree, if, if, you know, this is a novel concept for many of us, um, uh, yeah, presenting in person is, uh, is a lot more, uh, <laughs> it has its advantages, of course, um, and, and, and I mean, you know, first off, trying to join the Zoom session in the first place was a little difficult, <laughs> uh, as you might have noticed, but um, the other thing was, like, um, also maintaining that consistency with uh, trying to operate and, and, and maintain that those verbal cues and while also presenting and um, that was just a, a personal barrier I experienced um, and this is my first time I pitched with this uh, particular uh, idea so the challenges with that is you know trying to take a step back and look at everything you have to present and the judges ask some great questions and uh, you know certainly things to implement think about um, moving forward. So it's just hard to, to capture that all in a five minute presentation. Justin, thank you for sharing that. We are definitely working uh, very hard to make sure that we don't have technical issues in the future. Uh, certainly some folks have had issues uh, coming joining in and we don't know why that is happening. Um, I, I guess we can just blame Zoom for that. But some folks uh, that had issue uh, joining over because they did not have VC email ID. And although we did not uh, we don't think that should be an issue, but appears to be uh, the problem here. Uh, but I, we really appreciate your feedback um, uh, and we'll make sure that the next time we do this, we figure these things out uh, ahead, well ahead in time. Anyone else who would like to share their experience with uh, this event? Uh, I'm sorry, actually, do you mind if I ask a quick question to the, uh, to the presenters? Just uh, trying to enter my things and keep my notes straight. Um, would each uh, person who presented just say their name and the business that they uh, that they had? Assuming that we're starting in order of presentation, Jordan Wilson, politicking. I guess I presented next. Ed Armstrong tried it. I think I might have been after that. Uh, Justin Zamora of Zephyr. Alex Freed, finance matcher. Uh, Henry Cabot, lapel. Uh, Thomas Katuki, very rechargeable battery. Terrific. Thank, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. All right, while, while the judges uh, are finalizing their scores, uh, we would really appreciate anyone else's uh, experience. Um, 
what they're, you know, uh, what, how intent helped them uh, provide the resources to, to put this all together. Um, anything that you guys want to share? I think it was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was really nice to have deadlines. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to stay motivated. And I think intent provided a really great framework for uh, my team and I to just uh, like stay motivated, stay on it, uh, get working on PowerPoint, start fleshing out ideas more, uh, more fully. Um, I think we had a lot of fun. What more could we have done? How, what else could we have done that would have helped you perform better uh, in this event? Shala would have loved to have like a pre or post sort of networking section session amongst each other or with judges or, you know, with anyone affiliated with the organization. Jordan, thank you for bringing that up. We actually do have, we did have that um, uh, session uh, for, for networking. Unfortunately, we chose to uh, conduct this uh, event as a webinar and webinar doesn't allow uh, breakout rooms. Something that I am just learning today before <laughs> while getting this uh, event going. So point noted for the next event for sure. However, you do have access to uh, the judge uh, judges information. I suggest you to reach out to them and uh, seek support for their insights. These folks have either been academically involved entrepreneurially or have uh, been successful entrepreneurs themselves. So I, I strongly suggest you to reach out to them and that could be a great way to network. Alexis, you are a part of our uh, incubator program. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about your experience through the incubator, incubator program and how it helped you get to this point? Yeah, sure thing. So the particular apprenticeship, I, oh, sorry. Um, so there were a lot of things in the incubator program that I found really helpful, like the business plan template and the really long questionnaire that I got earlier in the year. Um, it was really helpful to just, like, especially since I haven't taken any business classes and I'm coming at this from an accounting perspective, which is very different from, you know, actually being in the business and doing a lot of the entrepreneurial stuff. I found it really helpful to just go through the entire process, break down what the revenue streams were, customers, and then va value propositions and all that sort of stuff. And then just kind of refine everything as I went through and was like, oh, this seems a little too general. I can make it a little more specific, but then that completely disagrees with something else I wanted to add on. And yeah, I think Intent provided me with a lot of really, really helpful resources to get me to the point of actually participating in the competition. How was your, um, this sounds like a bit of an unbiased question because I, I, I believe I was your mentor for the incubator program, but in, uh, mentorship is something that is critical to our incubator program uh, because, uh, you know, students are learning, all the mentors are, by the way, students uh, at uh, Boston College, um, and they're all learning different things in different classes, and they're trying to bring all those in, in a, you know, packet uh, to our stu uh, student uh, participants. And I would like to kind of uh, get your thoughts on what was that interaction like? How, how, what are the things that really helped? What were the things that did not work? What are the things that you would like to see differently next year? Yeah, so I found it really helpful just to have a mentor in the first place because I had no idea what I was doing when I first entered. I, like I had a business idea, but had no idea how to actually make my idea into words. And I think you really helped out a lot with that, Vishal. Um, the one thing I kind of wish, and this isn't your fault at all, but I just kind of wish that the person I worked with had more of a finance background rather than a biochem, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, molecular biology. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, but yeah, that's really the only downside I could have, I could think of. No, that, that is uh, certainly a genuine, uh, a, 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 a rational uh, feedback. And we are working hard to have more mentors with more diverse backgrounds. Um, I, you know, I was able to help you learning whatever I was learning uh, in the MBA program. Obviously it was limited because uh, I am not uh, you know, I don't have uh, a bachelor's and a master's in business at all. But um, again, uh, I'm happy to be able to help you uh, however I could. Next year, we are going to seek out more mentors uh, with, um, with, with a diverse background uh, to basically address this very issue. I think, uh, I think the scores are in, Vishal.
Fantastic. Let's let's make our announcements. Who are who's our first uh, second uh, winner and and our first winner? Okay, uh, I'll lead these off. So coming in in a very close second place, um, just on the heels of first. Um, I thought this person did a really good job. Really interesting business idea. Um, love the passion that she brought to the project. Uh, so second place uh, for the inaugural intent pitch competition is uh, Jordan Wilson. So it's Jordan. Congrats, Jordan. And uh, and our first place winner um, had a very very clear, very concise pitch. Um, she was you know very it was clear that she had practiced. Very interesting business idea, well thought out. And the winner is Alexis Freed. Congratulations, Alexis. That is fantastic. Guys, this is this is incredible. Thank you so much. This uh, means a lot to us for your participation. Uh, it's so amazing how many great ideas were shared today. And it gave us a, an opportunity to really see what we have done so far and be able to continue uh, this uh, in, in the future. Um, I would highly recommend uh, everyone has access to each other's email. I recommend reaching out to each other if you have any questions, uh, concerns, or, or just want to talk. Uh, because since in, in the pandemic world, this is the way we communicate. Uh, also, you know, it makes it easy for us. Uh, it's easier to, to connect over Zoom, over Zoom or Google Meet. I highly recommend you to do that, uh, not only with judges, but also with other participants. Um, with that, thank you very much for your participation and your time. Uh, let us know uh, if you have any further questions, concerns, comments. We would love to have you all back next year, if not as participants, as, 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 as audiences. Uh, with that, I think that that uh, really uh, that ends our uh, event for the day. Any other any last comments? I'd just like to add that I really enjoyed everyone's pitch. I really think it's great that everyone's coming out here with these great ideas. Um, you know, entrepreneurship is just a as much a a path and a, an idea as it is a mentality. And I think everyone was thinking very innovatively, very creatively. Love that everyone put themselves out here. So thank you all for attending. This has been great. Thank you. And I'd just like to add, <clears throat> so I co-founded uh, Intent in 2016, and this has been a to-do item since the inception of what Intent can do for us graduate students to build networking opportunities and skills that can really drive our career going forward. And I just want to say thank you, Vishal. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Cooper. Thank you, Mint. Thank you, Rajan. And thank you all presenters for an, uh, an outstanding job. I am so proud of all you guys. What a, an amazing opportunity just to like hear your ideas and see all the thought you put into it. A lot of opportunity here for, you know, career paths. If this is something that you want to go down. So, and I think it's for a few of you, it's definitely the case. So thank you so much. I would love to have you guys come back to our next intent event. So for those Again, we do monthly workshops. We do uh, apprenticeships with local startups. If you really want to get a feel of what a startup's like, we have the incubator program and then we have the accelerator. So for those who are really going all out on this idea, I would like to invite you to come back and think about our accelerator program, which takes your idea that's been qualified and will help scale it so you can get ready for our investor funding. So food for thought, would love to like continue the conversation. I'm going to stop talking now. Have a great night. This has been really enjoyable to watch. Before, before okay. people leave, I just wanted to make sure that people know this, that in order to qualify uh, for, your, for our accelerator program, you don't have to be a current mem uh, student at BC. We also support alumni. So this is the first step for uh, an entrepreneur journey, and you have already taken it. Congratulations on that. The next step could be our accelerator program, and you're more than welcome to join us starting next year. Uh, if you have any interest, let us know, and we'll provide you with all the information. Uh, with that, I do want to make sure that uh, every, all the judges do get a chance to say anything if they have to, if they have anything to add. To add. Rajan, Min, this is your moment. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I uh, really enjoyed everyone's pitches and, and everyone's great ideas, and I think, you know, the future, all of your futures are really bright. The future of intent is really bright, and, you know, I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, just seeing how far all these companies can go and, you know, the sky's the limit. Mint? Sorry, I, I'm not really good at like giving speech, something like this, but 
Yeah, so I, I, I think for my entrepreneurship experience and, and, and I was an international student from Thailand and I, I mean, everything is very hard for me when I came here, start study here and then start a business here. And I, I, I think it's very good to see um, BC student and also alumni that is willing to, to, I mean, to take an opportunity to start a business and everything like this. Because when I start my journey, uh, starting my own company, I didn't, I, I didn't meet that much. Um, entrepreneur from Boston College mostly is going to be any other university and it's always made me wonder like why Boston College like didn't have anything like this maybe mentorship or something like this but it's great that I see that the um you guys create this organization to support the um entrepreneurship in BC yeah and I am always happy to help and happy to share all my experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, man. Uh, Jordan and Alexis, we are going to send you your prized uh, gift cards by tomorrow morning. So stay tuned. <laughs> thank you for that. Wow. Thanks. Of course. Thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, just a quick question, because one of the elements of this was uh, networking. And I wanted to know uh, in regards to the question that Jordan asked, um, you know, uh, if we can have access to the, the judging panel's information so we can follow up? Uh, for sure. So you all will get uh, uh, feedbacks, uh, more extended comments on your performance. And you also have in your registration section, uh, in your registration, uh, how the, pay, the, 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 uh, the form that you use for registration, uh, all of the um, judges' information is there. You are able to connect with them on LinkedIn, reach out to them. Uh, all the judges have been a part of in, uh, intent. They are incredible people and uh, way too uh, willing to help out however they can. Reach out to them, connect with them, and, uh, and, and take it from there. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.